And now to our lab. It's time for some big body experiments. Some of them gory. This is not for the squeamish. Some extreme. It's freezing! So are you ready? Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, we're looking inside your head. Your brain controls pretty much everything going on in your body, so damaging it can be serious. Now, unluckily, it's very fragile, but luckily, our brains have some super protection. That's right, Chris. I am Maximus Brainius Protectoris, leader of the Ninth Legion, conqueror of Rome, protector of brains. Zand, I was thinking more along the lines of this. Oh. Oh. <sighs> Took me ages to get all this on. Now, this is a real human skull. Your brain is so important that your skull has a special safety system installed in it. That's right, brain gladiators. No, Zand, it is a clear, colourless liquid called cerebrospinal fluid. It acts as a cushion to protect your brain. And there's not much of it, about the same amount as the water in this jar. And to show you how it works, we're going to need to break some eggs. Imagine this jar is your skull. And I'm putting these eggs in to represent your delicate brain. What would happen to the brain in this skull without any cerebrospinal fluid? Zond, shake the skull. <laughs> well, as you can see, your brain would be seriously damaged. But what happens if the jar is full of water, just like the cerebrospinal fluid inside your skull? <laughs> the eggs remain intact, and so does your brain because the cerebrospinal fluid fills the gaps between it and your skull. <sighs> you can see defeat, Zond. The cerebrospinal fluid has vanquished me. And as well as cerebrospinal fluid, your brain has another amazing piece of super protection. We're talking about the cranium, the dome of the skull that protects the brain. And we're going to show you how. I think it's time I retired from being a gladiator. Yes, Zand, white coat's on. As you can see here, the average thickness of this part containing the brain is only about half a centimetre. And it has to be that thin because it has to be light. Having a heavy head would be really difficult. I mean, imagine if your head was as heavy as, say, a, a watermelon. watermelon. <whistles> uh, well, what is it like having a watermelon on your head? It's very, very heavy. I mean, I'm getting a really sore neck. So that is why your skull needs to be thin. And yet, despite being so thin, it is incredibly strong, as we're about to show you. Zand, will you go and get some skulls, please? To the cupboard of everything! Look, I've found a skull here, Chris, but it's got lots of different lids, and some of them are pretty weird. Yep. I want to show you why our skull's shape gives it strength. And to do that, we need to compare it to some other shaped skulls. We've got a model skull with a traditional top, one that's flat, and one that's spiky. And to see which skull is the strongest, we need some kind of smashing device. Oh, well, we could always use my drop rig. It's right there. I call him Smashy. Nice ones, aren't? That looks perfect. We're going to drop a set weight onto the top of each skull, starting from a height of 15 centimetres, to see if it smashes. Let's see which shape fares best. Ready, Zond? Release the smasher. Smashy! <laughs> if you'd gone to all the trouble to grow spikes on your head, you'd be pretty disappointed with that result. Flathead, it's your turn. Zond, release the smasher. It's called Smashy. Right. Well, that was disappointing. We need more force. Let's double the smashy height, Chris. Ah! <laughs> well, we got flat head that time. Now let's try the traditional design. Traditional for a reason, Zand. Here we go. Three, two, one. Seems to be OK so far. Let's raise the bar. This is where flat head smashed. This might hurt. Wow! We're now at 40 centimetres. We've pushed this further than ever before. Release Smashy! The human skull is hardcore! Surely it has to give at some point. Ready? Ready. Three, two, one. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> so we've shown you that your extremely important, very special brain is protected in not one, but two ways. 
<laughs> Firstly, by a layer of cerebrospinal fluid providing a safety cushion. And secondly, by your skull. Despite being only 6.5 millimetres thick, your skull is the perfect brain protector, thanks to its shape. Chris, I've come to say goodbye. Goodbye? I thought you'd retired from gladiatorial combat after your humiliating defeat by the cerebrospinal fluid. Well, yes, yes, I had retired, and then I realised there was another body part I could protect with my gladiatorial skills. People's hearts! I will travel throughout the land wherever people cry out. Off I go. You'll never see me again. The heart's protected by the rib cage. Zahn, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to write a new science book. It's all about Professor Albert Grumblestein and his quest to make a new human brain using stardust. Well, actually, Zahn, there are scientists right here on Earth who are already making human brains in labs. It's not the future, it's happening now. Where do they get their stardust from? They're not using stardust, Zahn, they're using stem cells. Time for investigation. Ouch. This is a fake brain, but we're going to show you a real human brain. Look away now if you're squeamish. Your brain is packed with a hundred billion cells called neurons. They control pretty much everything you do. The brain is such a complex organ that if something goes wrong with it, either through injury or disease, it can be very hard to fix. This is Professor Rafalov. He is exploring and developing the cutting-edge technology needed to grow a human brain. But Professor Rafalov isn't looking to grow a whole brain just yet. He's investigating growing small pieces first. So the human brain is the most complicated thing we know about. Where do you even start? We need to start from stem cells. Every cell in your body begins life as a stem cell. They are like blank cells waiting to be given a job to do, whether they become hair cells, blood cells or brain cells. <laughs> Professor Rafalov has already turned these stem cells into neurons, but in order to develop them into a brain, they require a 3D support. This is a 3D nanoprinter. Nano means very, 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 very small. This printer can print things that are 100,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And that is pretty small. Now, what is it printing at the moment? It's a printing now 3D scaffolds for neurons to live on. This 3D scaffold is basically a frame to support the neurons and help them divide and grow. But where is it? Because I can't see anything. It is it's very small. It's just size that's below one millimeter. You know, even if I get in really close, I cannot see what's going on. So in order to understand this brain scaffolding, we're going to have to supersize it. This is a very simple scaffolding design, similar to the one that Professor Rafaloff is using. But mine is a lot bigger. OK, and print. To show you how a neuron scaffold works, I'm using this normal 3D printer. Ten hours later, and it's cooked. My supersized scaffold is ready for some brain cells. I have some here in this aerosol can. Now, in fact, this is expanding foam, but it represents brain cells. You can see the foam filling the spaces between the scaffold. And this is what the brain cells would be doing on Professor Rafaloff's nano version. And now the neurons can grow and connect to each other in three dimensions, just like they would in a real brain. Although I must admit, I didn't know growing a brain was going to be such a messy business. This is my version. So how much smaller is your scaffold than mine? I, I would say it's a million times smaller than what you build. You can fit a million of yours into one of mine. Yes. Professor Rafalov's may be a million times smaller, but we can take a closer look through a microscope to see how neurons develop. Now we have neurons growing on a scaffold. On a scaffold, yes. And why are they flashing? Flashing shows us that neurons start to connect to each other. They just start to talk to each other. So these neurons, they're already forming a brain-like circuit. Yes. Wow! Essentially, what you've made here is the first step toward building a human brain. Yes. Can you believe that in the future, if you were to damage your brain, they might be able to mend it with something that was printed in a lab? 
you know that your brain produces enough electricity every hour of every day and night to power a light bulb? Ouch. And now to our lab. It's time for some big body experiments. Some of them gory. This is a real pair of cow's lungs. Some extreme. It's freezing! We're ready. Are you? Just don't try anything you see here at home. Hi, Chris. Are you all right? Yes, there seems to be something going on with your cupboards. Get out of the way. I've got to get the samples for today's experiment. Right, dance sample, out you come. It's enough of that. Language sample, come on. Hola, me llamo Charlie. Okay, all right, enough showing off. And now music sample. <laughs> enough of that. Zand, what is going on? I'm so sorry, I forgot my manners. Introductions. Music sample, language sample, and dance sample meet Dr. Chris. Hi, Abby, Charlie, and Elias. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. My samples are all very talented at very different things, as you can see, but they do have one thing in common, and it's something they have in common with you as well. You just can't see it. It's called neuroplasticity, and it's what enables you to learn everything you know. You're right, Zahn. Your brain is made up of billions of nerve cells, or neurons, with billions of connections, a bit like this. Now, you may have heard of your grey matter. That's the surface of the brain, and it's the bit that does the thinking. But parts of the grey matter need to be connected to other parts using the white matter, and that's represented by these fibre-optic cables here, the fast connections between different parts of your brain and they allow you to do anything and everything. But they aren't all set in stone. In fact, every time you learn something, like, say, how to say something in Spanish... Tengo 13 años. ...or how to do a new dance move... <laughs> ..your brain changes and makes new connections, and this is neuroplasticity. And it basically means your brain can kind of rewire itself. Uh, hello, what, what about me? I'm getting to you. In fact, Every time you try and play a new piece of music... Zant! <coughs> Every time you practice a piece of music, your brain reinforces the connections and it becomes easier than the last time. And it's exactly the same as when I play my trumpet. I've been practicing all morning, so I should be really good at it. Best get out of here, guys. Zant. I don't understand, Chris. I've been practising for literally minutes. I mean, I should be pretty good, shouldn't I? It's not that simple. And to find out why it's not that simple, we need to go outside. Come on, Zand, and come on you. Zand, this is my brain. It's more like a giant pile of sand. Bear with me on this, Zand. These channels that I've made represent the connections in my brain. And you are wearing a bottle of information on your back, right there. Now, why don't you pour the information into the top of the brain, and what you'll see is the information flows through the existing channel in my pile of sand brain. So what's happening is the channel gets deeper, the water finds it easier to make its way through the sand. This is just like information in your brain. When you do something you've done before, the information uses the same connections it's used in the past. It picks the quickest and most effective route. A bit like the channels in the sand. So what would happen if you tried to learn a brand new skill? Well, Zand, why don't you start pouring information into the top of the brain? But this is new information, and it needs to take a new path. So the information gradually starts to flow through, but there's no good channel initially. It has to find a path. And you can see a channel is forming as Zahn does more and more practice. But it's not very deep, and information is taking a long time to get through. And as Zahn practices this new skill, the channel becomes deeper, and the information can flow more efficiently. So is this why I wasn't very good at the trumpet after literally minutes of practice? That's right, Zahn, because it takes longer than a few minutes to improve the speed of the connections between different parts of your brain. In fact, it can take months or even years to reach your full skill level. But there's one more thing I can show you on my amazing model brain made of sand. Wow, what's that? I can show you what would happen if your brain got an injury. I put the shovel in there. The information now can't get through. Zand, pour some information in the top of the brain. 
So that's amazing. What you can see now is the information gets stopped at the site of injury and it can't get past the shovel. But this is where your brain is amazing. As the information flows toward the shovel, gradually your brain is able to make new connections and find new pathways. And sometimes this means your brain can recover and regain function after even quite a severe injury. So we've shown you all about the connections in your brain, which enable you to do everything. It's called neuroplasticity. And we've shown you that your brain is constantly making new connections every time you learn something new. It can even rewire itself if it gets damaged. Well, I must say, Zan, that is sounding a lot better. You must have really strengthened up those neural connections. I'll let you get on with it.